So today we switch gears a little bit, but I try to announce it in my so orientation lecture that we, today we are hitting on a very important point, important for the coupling of discrete and discrete and the continuous world, namely in the continuous world how to get what I might call stable variation formulations and which allow you to sort of inherit from the infinite dimensional relevant setting important information in the finite dimension case. So the framework, we are happy to have two experts in that emerging framework. Three. Has been, you yourself being well, number one. Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Who are going to uh, give us uh, an introduction to, uh, to this kind of methodology? First one is Professor Demkowitz from Austin. Thank you very much. Um, so this is going to be a very fundamental presentation, just four lectures. And in the first one, I'm, I'm going to review the background. And the first part of it is very classical. It's a combination of relevant facts from functional analysis and numerical analysis. So I hope that all of you know it. Or heard about that. The question is whether you see the high-level connections and are aware of implications. The second part is perhaps a little bit less known. It's going to be about different vari various variational formulations. It's going to uh, touch uh, non-classical sublet spaces, energy spaces, and so on. And again, uh, there are some very important implications of, from, of that part for the rest of the lectures. The actual technical lectures are going to be given by Jay. I always pass the job to him. <laughs> so, who is going to cover first the the idea of the main idea of optimal test functions, and show you how surprisingly we realized that we arrived at uh, a minimum residual formulation, and the, and then a, a bit later realized this is uh, the work of, of Wolfgang that this can be all reformulated as a mixed method. As a matter of fact, I will start with Wolfgang's perspective today in the first lecture, right? And he's going to give you some uh, details on where the 410 operators, very typical tool for mixed problems, fit in here. Uh, Act three is about breaking forms and spaces. If I had to tell you what the DPG is about in one sentence, I would say it's a combination of two concepts, the concept of optimal test functions and the concept of broken or product or discontinuous test spaces. The D in DPG stands for discontinuous test functions. It does not stay for discontinuous trial functions, right? It's the discontinuous test functions. And this part is probably the most technical. Uh, we uh, zigzag for a few years publishing uh, our first papers on convergence and about what was it, three years ago, right? I think we, we hit it right finally with the help of Karsten Karstensen. There is a, uh, what I consider to be a breakthrough paper that we published that has exactly this title, Breaking Forms and Spaces. And Act 4 is going to go back to me. I'm going to show you what we are working on uh, currently flash a few examples so you have an idea what we can do with that on the practical side and why it got, in particular, me so excited uh, after all those years of working on higher order methods. And I will mention two important topics that I think they're relevant to what we're talking about here. The DPG star method and in context of goal-oriented adaptivity and very few personal slides on a, on a big development that is happening right now, and that is how to do the DPG mu resume methods in Banach spaces, right? There was a lot of talk about Banach spaces yesterday, so I think it's a relevant connection, a logical connection to show. Okay, so I saw that Jay has all this nice overlay, you know, on slide star one, on slide star two uh, things, and Volgan has had them as well. Guys, I didn't have time energy to purge all in one slide. So I'm going to walk you through the slide. 
So this is the language that we use. This is what we call the abstract variational problem, right? And for today, we're going to stay in the Hilbert space setting. This, I mean, for the first lecture, U and V are trial and test spaces. This is a cesspool in a form that means linear and U, anti linear and V, L is anti linear and V, so it's an element of the dual space in a complex set, setting, right? And if we are in the infinite dimensional setting, I always say, repeat to students that it goes without saying that everything is continuous. In the infinite dimensional setting, we are not interested in objects that are not continuous. Function analysis is about putting together algebra and topology, topology right? <clears throat> and then you have what some people call the Natchez theorem. Uh, some other people call it Babushka Natchez theorem. That's the name on Wikipedia, you know, for this theorem. And some people call it Banach Babushka Natchez theorem, and you will see in a moment why. The theorem says the following. Here is your favorite variational problem. I'll give you examples, more examples, quite a few examples in this very lecture yet. And you have to satisfy two sets of conditions. The first one is a stability condition. We call it in sub condition. You look at it, where is the inf? There's only sub here. Well, you divide by the norm of u, and you take the inf, inf has to be greater great than equal than gamma. So it's hidden there. It's an equivalent statement of the in sub condition. And the second is compatibility condition. You take a subspace of the test function that doesn't see all trial functions, right? Your right hand side, the load, has to vanish on that subspace. So if you satisfy this stability condition and this compatibility condition for that particular right hand side L, then the theorem guarantees that there exists a unique solution to this variational problem and you have stability result, right? So the norm of the solution is bounded by the inverse of the stability constant, right? Times the norm in the dual space of your linear functional f. Okay? So that's the first part. This is called usually Babushka Natchez theorem or just Natchez theorem. Natchez was the very first graduate student of Ivo Babushka. He was still alive and kicking. He's turning 92 next month, right? And officially retired, but keeps coming as usual every day. Right? And he says that actually it's a nice thing as he retired because his salary actually has increased now. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> he was half time. Yeah, that, that's, you know, he has moved to. Yeah, so he, he draws more money than he did when <laughs> that he was officially on the payroll. Okay, so I'm going to reformulate this, these conditions in terms of the operator equation. So, first of all, with everybody in a form, right, we can introduce the corresponding operator. And the nature of the variation formulation is that the operator defined by the bilinear assessment in a form goes from the space u not into v but into the dual on v prime. You may argue that the very nature of variational problem is that you're dealing with operators that take place always in the dual space. Right? That's because of testing business. And that operator is continuous. And then this condition, if you recall the definition of the operator and the fact that Supreme defines the dual norm, is nothing that the boundness below. So the operator, corresponding to the sesquina we know by in the form, has to be bounded below. That's the boundness below constant. And the bar of introduced. And then this condition says nothing else than if you take the operator the adjoint, people use different names here, conjugate, adjoint, transpose operator, right? So this is in the simple setting operator uh, 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 corresponding to uh, the, the, the symmetric version of B in the complex setting you switch, right? Uh, the guys and you put the complex conjugate on that and you get B prime going from V into, oh, first time, into U prime, this is U prime, and because you are in a Hilbert space setting, V is isomorphic with the bidual, and therefore you are back into the uh, Banach setting, and this condition, then this is nothing else than the null space of B prime, and this condition says that L is taken 
from the orthogonal complement of the null space of B prime, and you recognize Banach closed range theorem for continuous operators. There are two closed range theorems, one for continuous operators, one for closed operators. Banach proved the first one, although Yoshida gives him also credit for the second one. The second one, I'll talk about it, was proved much later. Right, different people, right? For closed operators. This is for continuous operators, right? And that's why the name of Banach appears here, because from the functional analysis point of view, this theorem is nothing else than a simple reformulation of Banach theorem, right? To the setting of operators going from U into V prime, period, generated by a sesquina form like this. How many of you have seen that connection before? Oh, that's clear, but <laughs> students haven't. So, so this is the first thing to see. This is described in detail in our uh, everything they talk about here on functional analysis levels in our book with Tinsley. So, of course, there are many other texts which are covered. Okay, so that's step one. Step two, uh, we introduce the concept of Petrov Galarkin, right? So, what's the difference between Petrov Galarkin and Galarkin, or books of Galarkin? So, Galarkin published his famous paper in 1914. Bubnov was his colleague in the institute at the, at the time, and the name of bubnov galarkin was added later to distinguish from the petrov galarkin method. Alexander Pietrovich, Piet Alexander Pietrov, I forgot this, oh, yes, what's his name, uh, published his famous paper almost 50 years later, in 59. It's much later, and he actually died only a few years ago, right? Uh, and he, he came up with the idea which, in context of settings where the trial and the test space is different, is very natural. Galertin was concerned with mostly self agent problems. He was a structural mechanician, a mechanician working on places, original problem, right? And so what the Peter Galertin method uh, proposed is that you have a finite dimensional trial subspace of view, a finite dimensional test subspace of V, right, and you formulate a uh, approximate variation problem as a pattern of the lurking approximation by seeking U H in the finite dimensional guy and testing it with the finite dimensional test spaces. And because you want to end up with a square system, same number of unknowns as equations, you request that these two guys are the same. Now, if you are in a symmetric functional setting, u and v is the same, then you choose v h to be the same as u h, and that's the Galerkin map, or boon of Galerkin. Right? There's no issue then how to choose v h. But if you have a different function, functional trial and test spaces, that's not obvious. How do you choose guys that live in those spaces, right? So, in this concept, there's no stabilization it's a straightforward discretization where you use the bilinear linear forms set from the continuous level. All you do is you operate within, you know, finite dimensional set spaces. Okay? And then what the Babushka theorem says is the following. If you take now the finite dimensional equivalent of the in condition that we had before, so the supremum is taken over the H, coming only from the finite dimensional test space, and you're concerned only with the finite dimensional trial spaces, and you get here now what we call the discrete in constant. Then, on this condition alone, based on this condition, you can conclude that there exists a unique solution, UH, to your uh, pattern of the approximation. So you may, at this moment, ask me, wait a minute, so what happened with the compatibility condition, right? I mean, the previous thing, I had the compatibility conditions on a continuous level. On a discrete level, I don't have compatibility conditions, right? Can anybody answer this question except for those guys? Why do I need the compatibility condition on a discrete level? Well, because on a discrete level, Rank of operator square matrix equals the rank of the transpose. And this condition says that A, right, the, my stiffness matrix is non singular, as a, uh, and, 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 and therefore the, the adjoint matrix is also 
transpose matrix is also non-singular, and, and therefore that condition is something trivially on the discrete level because this guy is trivial. Stress to you. But you don't need that condition. That condition is hidden in here, in the assumption that you want to have the same number of test functions at this. So, uh, so there exists a unique solution, and you have the same stability estimate. So at this moment, Evo doesn't get any credit because this is simply a particle uh, application of the you know previous theorem, right? Nothing new, just in the final dimensional setting. But there's a second line to this theorem. And that's where the real meat comes in. The error measured in your trial energy norm is bounded by two, by the product of two guys. The second one is, 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 is known as the best approximation error. You take the exact solution, all the regularities you get, and your functional space that has been cleverly determined, maybe in an adaptive way, right? This is the best you can get. This is the best approximation error. By definition, it has infimum here. You can go below that. And then this is pre-multiplied by what we call the stability constant. B is the continuity constant for the form B. So B of U, B is bounded by this guy times the norm of U and B, right? So, I don't know whether you're used to this notation. B of U B, right? This is M. Many people say U times B. This is U V. This is your continuity condition. The best M, right, is is identified as the norm in the space of bilinear forms. Okay, so I'm using this notation, and then gamma zero is a lower bound that better be positive for those discrete unit constants, right? And when I teach the open, beginning class on galeric methods and final methods, I make my class recycle the following statement. Approximability and st discrete stability, or more precisely uniform discrete stability, imply convergence. Approximability and discrete stability, discrete stability. Not continuous stability, discrete stability imply convergence, right? And if this converges with some rate, this will converge with the same rate. And then the method is called optimal, right? Because you, you're converging with the best rate you can get from the approximability point of view. Now, uh, as Jay will tell you in a moment, the, bay, the, big, the main trouble in all this business is that. The in condition on the continuous level does not imply the in condition on the discrete level. So continuous stability does not imply discrete stability. By the way, the same phrase was coined actually earlier by Peter Lax in his famous paper that arrived at the same condition in context of finite difference methods. And it's very educational to read the first page and a half of Peter Lack's paper, where he clearly implies that it is much more difficult to prove discrete stability than continuous stability. Hence, all he and his colleagues working on discretization are much smarter than their PDE colleagues at Pura. Okay, This is the implication. Have you read that paper? It's very clear <laughs> the way he writes them. Chandra. Yeah, so how do you show this invariant to the discretization? I'm sorry? So this is a condition based on the discretization that you chose. This is this How is show invariance under any possible discretization that you might take. There's no invariance, this is just one discretization. Yeah, so for this discretization you're showing optimality. Well, this is very so does there exist some other possible sure, and you have some other you might get even a better balance. Yes. So therefore this is not the optimal optimal is optimal in this context, because why is it optimal? Because this is the best approximation yeah. error, if you right? you choose your trial space, it's optimal. So, so once you... Yeah, so you can try to choose the good you way. You, you, can, yeah. you can still take a better U, yes, and then, but then you have to find a better, another V. Sure, so, so it's the couple. So I mean, so if, if, that, if that constant is one, 
by some miracle that will occur in the second lecture, right? Then you have a projection, because then this guy lives here as well, and therefore you have equality. So you have then orthogonal projection. But in general, that constant is not one. It's bigger than one. <coughs> okay. All right. And so Ivo's paper was published in uh, 71. 71. Actually, it was an issue 70 slash 71, but I think it appeared in 71. Two years later, there's a famous paper about, published by Franco Brezzi on a class of mixed problems. The, these are the mixed problems. Uh, now you have two guys, two players, a U, and we like to think about it as a Lagrange multiplier, because this type of mixed problem you arrive at from constrained minimization problems. If this structural, structural mechanics we arrive at this problem from minimization of uh, total potential energy, then here this is under constraint. Stokes being the, the, the most common examples, of course there are plenty of other examples, and a functional setting now is symmetric. But you have a, you have what, a group variable. You have two guys, two unknowns, and two testing. And you, if you break it into two functions, then this is what you get. Now, all it takes is to put these two guys into a single group variable, put the test functions into a single group variable, define a new bilinear form that is obtained by summing up these guys on the left-hand side, Defining a new linear form that you obtain by sum summing up these two guys, or anti linear form more precisely, and you can reformulate the mixed problem as the original variational formulation. Okay. Now, that's not what Franco did. Franco treated that ab initio, and it was a long paper. But you can take the in condition, and this is both on the infinite dimensional and finite dimensional level, and in about two pages, show that this is fully equivalent to the two in sub conditions of Frank. And you can find it on my webpage, the, the notes for the class and teaching. It. It's about two pages, but it's not 100% trivial. Right? So there are two conditions that we talk about here. The first condition is identified as the so-called uh, babushka brezzi or la Dzenska babushka brezzi condition, the community LBB, the long piece there behind where the L appeared in there, right? That's the condition for this form B, coupling Q, Q and V, right? Okay? And the second condition is, a, is known as the in soup in the kernel. Because you have the guys, well actually the, the kernels, the guys that satisfy the constraint, right? Again, this is just a flip version of V, right? And then you're asking for the stability in the kernel. These two conditions are fully equivalent to that condition. You give me gamma, I can give you estimates for beta and alpha zero. And in fact, it's gamma. So in the second one, the B is an A. The B form. The second of this one? No, on the left. It should be an A. It should be the, the bilinear form A. This, no, no, this, no, this no, is this is this is this is this no, guy. No, no. Mm -hmm. Here, this super oh yeah, yeah. Zero. I'm so, I'm sorry. Another another. This is A. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Another. Two typos. Sorry. Yes. Of course. Yeah. This is A. This is this guy. That's the coercive guy. Oh, that's the current. Well, yeah, well it may, it not may not be coercive. Maybe. Right? This is yeah. So so in this case, in this sense. When I teach the subject, I always tell students, well, Babushka, Bretzi is a special case of Babushka. Because, okay, Frank was ingenious, but I don't have to be ingenious if I know how to do algebra. I take the Babushka result from two years earlier and, and, and push it to get the same two conditions. By the way, Ivo, the reason Ivo's B, Babushka, Bretzi is because he worked on mixed problem too. So it's, so it's not it's just this, this relation, it was. The credit was given to him because he, he I believe he already had a condition like this. But it was a wonderful, wonderful paper written by, of course, Franco, and, and this is the whole beginning from 73 of the mixed matter theory. But here's the surprise, and the Wolfgang gets credit for that. Okay, So if Bretzi is a special case of Babushka, well, Babushka is a special case of Bretzi too. 
And that is a little bit more difficult to see. <laughs> so, okay, so here it is. We look at our original equation. I start with the operator form, BU equals L. Good? Now I define residual, L minus BU. Well, so if BU equals L, then the residual is zero on the continuous level. So you're looking at the zero guy. Now, residual is what kind of animal? It lives in the dual space of B, because B takes me from U into B prime, right? So I take this residual and recall the Ries representation theorem and introduce Psi. Psi is the Ries representation of the residual. This is the Ries operator. Okay, the second thing you have to be very comfortable with, the Ries theorem. Playable spaces, right? And because the residual is zero, and this guy is an isometric as homomorphism, then psi is zero, right? So if psi is zero, I can add whatever equation I want here because I'm talking about zero. So I add B prime. So obviously, if this guy satisfies this, then so does this one. And with the same condition as before, we actually have the full equation. Now let's look at this. On a, in, using the variational language. This is the same thing as this, right? Now, this is the same thing as that. that this is, I move BU to the left hand side, on the right hand side I have L, right? I recall the definition of the Ries operator, that's just the inner product in V. So that's your first equation, and then again, this is using the flip form, V star, that's it, right? Okay? Oh! So not only I can, if I'm interested in mixed problem, I can reduce it to Babushka's problem, but I am solving Babushka's problem. I can reduce the task of discretization to the mixed problem. Now what happens with the in subconditions? Well, here I have one, here I have two. But the first one is satisfied trivially because this is the most beautiful guy in the world you can have. It's an either product, right? So the in sub in kernel is satisfied with a constant one, another type. Oh, sorry, don't look at it. <laughs> it's a it's with a, with a, of course uh, with a, with a constant equal one, and not only the kernel, but in the whole space. So I don't have to worry about this part. So the only one part that remains is this. And you look at it and say, God, that's the same thing. So what have we gained? We have repacked the problem, right? And it was difficult here, and it remains difficult here as well. Okay. Can anybody in the audience tell me what had we gained from, by going from this framework to that framework? I know the one. You know the one. <laughs> Can anybody tell me what you gained? Because it looks like repackaging, right? Guys, conceptually, in Intuit, there's a huge gain. Why? Because when you discretize this problem, you worry about you and me having the same dimension. Remember, you want to have a square system. By the time you get here, you stop worrying about having equal dimension. There's no wrong condition that these two guys have the same dimension. So I can pump up the dimension of V, and the more Vs I get, the easier it is to satisfy that supremum, right? And the potential to satisfy the stability condition is much easier. Now there's a price I pay, and this psi, and that psi on the discrete level is not going to be zero. Okay? So you have more expensive problems to solve. Now I'm going to show you, or Jay will show you a technique of how the broken spaces reduce that extra cost only to local operations. So this is a very critical part of this whole idea to make it might be impractical, right? Although if you have very fast multi-grid solvers here and maybe you can survive in a different way. But that's how we've been doing that at least with Jay from day one. The psi also buys you something. Oh, the wine buys you. Well, Jay will talk about that. I'm not stealing his thunderbolts. Okay. So that's the first part and they're more or less on time. Okay. Now the second part of the introductory lecture deals with various variational formulations. And there is a not trivial connection to uh, the to the function analysis because you need to introduce now the closed range theorem, not only for continuous but also for closed operators. 
Uh, Yoshida was the beloved teacher, not only of his Japanese younger, but of everybody. Well, let me confess to you. There is a proof of close range theorem in Yoshida's book. I spent a week on this proof, in particular the first paragraph that I, that reduces the proof of closed range theorem for closed operators to the case of continuous operators. And not only I could not comprehend it, maybe it's my stupidity, but I convinced myself it's fairly simply wrong. <laughs> right? So then I go through the whole literature of all the famous, you know, Japanese younger colleagues of Yoshida, including Kato, none of them challenged the proof. They say, this is how Professor Yoshida does it. Here's our version. <laughs> <laughs> and I, in fact, the proof, that two alternative proofs, both by, one by Kato, another one, I forgot his name, I have it there in the computer, a, a, a Japanese from upstate New York, I believe. And then there's a German school contribution that go all the way to 69. So the close range thing for close operator, people still work on that in the functionalized community in the 69 late 60s. It's not trivial. It's not trivial. There's some very uh, delicate points there. Right? Now, let me say, in order to understand the mathematics behind what I will outline now, you need both of those closed range theorems. And I got so excited about that that not only I published a report, but I put that into the third edition of our functionality book. So you have the full theory there, and you have what I'm going to show you there as well, but you don't need to buy the book, this is for free, and all, everything is being shown there, okay? So, okay, here is our, not necessarily a potato with corners, right? Omega, two parts of the boundary. Ah, that's it, this is Lipschitz. And here is the model problem that God, every mathematician knows, right? Because when I was taught PDEs, the, the, the world in Krakow started and ended with that PDE. <laughs> <laughs> the first of Bajewski, the last most problem. So here is diffusion, here is convection, here is reaction, right? But guys, not just Laplace, the whole thing. Okay. 2,000 possible applications. And I have boundary conditions on U, so U is the temperature, will be a temperature, and on the total flux. So not only diffusion, but also convective flux on the other part. Now, what do, what do we do? Uh, with DPG. We break it into a first order system. This is not a unique construction choice, but in context of this boundary condition, right, on the total flux, it is natural to simply introduce sigma as an additional variable. This is the total flux, diffusive flux, and the convective flux. And then this is your conservation law, right? And then now you have flux boundary conditions and uh, whatever the original variable condition in gamma u. Now notice that I avoid carefully using the words Dirichlet and Neumann. There's no Dirichlet and Neumann. Just two sets of boundary conditions. Okay, now once I got myself a system of First of all, the equations, right? The two, two sets of them, all the, you know, right? these are vectors, so you have here more guys than here, it's a scalar equation, the vector equation, right? Then you have to repeat after the prince of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. What it was the prince of what? Hamlet. Hmm? Hamlet. Yes, Hamlet, but he was the prince of Denmark, right? Denmark. Of the Denmark. Denmark. Danish prince, Danish prince. Relax or not to relax? Okay, the important question to be asked. And what do I mean relax or not to relax? What do you mean by relaxation in finite element methods, right? right? Relaxation means always two things, and don't miss that. Integration by parts and, and I emphasize, and building boundary conditions in. So two things. Okay, so, so there are just two equations, and if I can relax or cannot relax, right, obviously I, I have how many choices? Four, right? Two times two is four. So 
before even doing anything, I can tell you, I'm going to have four variational formulations. And as you will see, the so-called mixed formulations will yield, under additional conditions, <laughs> two what we call reduced variational formulations. The one of them you'll discover is the one that perhaps you're very familiar with, the classical principle of visual work. But my first point is, the work goes beyond principle of visual work and so on space, classical principle of space. You have six possible variation formulations. Now, the mixed formulations use a symmetric functional setting, right? If you look at where the U and C are coming from, there's full symmetry here. So they're good candidates for Galerkin, for Bubner Galerkin. But the remaining two, strong material and what we call the ultra weak, Jay and I started to call it ultra weak, stealing the name from our French colleagues, Cessanat and Despret. And I apologize personally about that to Despret, I think two years ago, and he said, don't worry, I stole it from Lyons anyway. <laughs> so, so the name has been in use for a while, and exactly in this spirit that you pass all derivatives to test functions, right? So uh, these two formulations, strong and ultra weak, are enjoy non-symmetric functional setting. So you cannot use them with the standard alert for that stupid reason that you have different trial and test space, right? Now, this is where I sweep under the carpet the whole modification of the third edition of functional analysis that we did. It turns out that the in conditions for these four, actually six formulations, are practically equal. Some are equal, some are of the same order. Right? So if one of these problems is well posed, you have shown this well posed, you have well, immediately well posed of the other ones. Immediately, right? And this is where those two Banach theorems are at work. You know, we are on an infinite dimensional level here. We're not talking about any discretization yet. I'm just talking about variation formulations, okay? So let me walk you through those formulations. So here's the strong formulation, right? All you do is you multiply with test functions and you leave it alone. So you look, you look at this, aha, uh -huh, I have divergence of sigma, so sigma has to be coming from H diff, and I have to make sense of this boundary condition, so here's the trace theorem for H diff spaces that you have to be comfortable with, and the, the variable U has a gradient on it, so it comes from H1, and here's gamma, you know, you know, again, in the sense of trace, the boundary condition, and this is your variation formulation where this indicates inner product, L2 inner product, right? So, you haven't done any relaxation. Your test functions are L2 guys, right? That, that's the first case. Now, mixed formulation one, you take the constitutive, you, you take the, I'm sorry, you take the, uh, the uh, conservation law and you relax it. What does it mean? You multiply with the test function, you integrate by parts. So, divergence goes on to the gradient, the minus sign disappears. And you end up with a boundary term, which is sigma n times v. Sigma times n, the normal component times v. But you know sigma n. So this guy is built into the formulation, right? Uh, except that you know it only on gamma sigma. So you eliminate the unknown contribution by not testing on gamma. There's no miracle here. You just make a decision. I don't want to see the term. I'm not going to test it. Now, I don't know whether you have a chance to make a comment about later. There's nothing sacred about the decision. You can test from gamma u, but then you have an extra noun, and you're losing the symmetry of the formulation. But you're still fine with the DPG. And in fact, that's what we do in practice. It's much easier. Right? So anyway, but that's the classical relaxation leading to the symmetric functional setting. So this replaces now this. And the first guy stays as it was, just multiplied by tau. Look what happened. Both u and v come from the same functional space. Here you have a non-homogeneous boundary condition. On the testing side, you always have homogeneous boundary condition. So it's not symmetric, because here I even don't have a vector space. I presume that you have seen the concept of a lift and how we do it. Right, implemented with a lift. If not, if not, then assume for a moment this is zero. Okay, and otherwise the sigma 
and the, the tau, okay, for both, tau is in node 2, tau is in node 2, right? So, uh, and this is where the reducer classical formulation comes in, because I can take this first equation and say, well, if I haven't done anything to it, then it's still uh, equivalent to the point of version, except that now you understand it in the L2 sense. <coughs> that means almost everywhere, right? So I, I think Benjamin was sweeping some things under carpet too when he was been <coughs> kind of there, right? When you were talking about the classical Fourier's argument, right? In the, in, the, in the calculus variations. Because if you want to do those things on a strict fun functional analysis level, then again, things get more complicated there. You run into generalized Norman formula and density arguments and so on. It's a technical. So that was the engineering version of what I would call the derivation, which I use all the time myself, so nothing wrong with that. So the delicate thing is that now this is understood in the L2 sense. Right, but nevertheless, I, I, I'm here in the Lebesgue setting, so I, I, I can do that. And I simply substitute the second equation. This is your classical variation formulation, right? That involves just one unknown u and one v. And if you are a mechanical engineering student, your education will stop here. You will never be shown any other variation formulation. That's the only one, the sacred one. The whole world, including the entire final element commercial software, is supposed to be built on that. There's no other world, which is a big lie. Right? But the, the things are being taught in an oversimplified way by engineers. Right? So that's what we do. And this would be a candidate now for the uh, standard LRT method. Well, but of course, there's a mixed formulation too. You have your second choice. You can relax the first equation. And if you relax the first equation, what happens is, here's the, oh, so the two things. The first equation originally was had epsilon times u. Now, epsilon is a constant, so it doesn't matter, but if epsilon were not a constant, but let's say a function, right? Then you really have to divide by epsilon to have this e equation what they call ready for the integration by parts. You want the operator to be naked here, no coefficients in front of it. So it's again sort of a natural thing to do, to go into the inverse of epsilon, divide by epsilon, and then this guy goes on to tau and produces a boundary term, and you build the boundary condition in, and you eliminate the unknown part by, by assuming that you're not going to pass on gamma c, right? And you end up with, uh, with uh, then this problem, or if you can use the strong form of this to eliminate u, and you can use it provided you have a reaction term that is non zero. Right? Then you end up with this reduced formulation that uses on HD. Right? So, using the language of, of classical calculus of variations, now this is an essential condition, and the natural boundary condition has been built in. So, if I who want to be a PD person, I will call the first one Dirich the second Neumann. Now, do you understand why I'm not using that? Because what has Dirich level Neumann has changed, <coughs> right? I flipped the, the equations and so this is very unnatural for engineers saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're telling that sigma has, which is stress of flux, has more regularity than U is as L2? This is ridiculous. Well, sometimes mathematics is ridiculous or goes against the intuition. Let me tell you, from the mathematical point of view, this is almost as good, well, no, it's, 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 it's as good as the previous one. So I can solve, for instance, for fluxes in this formulation, if I have a reactive term, without ever visiting you. Same thing in elasticity. Under favorable, favorable conditions, if you're, lo you're looking at time harmonic, let's say, vibrations, you can solve for sigma without ever involving displacement. That surprises most of the engineers. Wait a minute, I can get stresses without displacement? Sure. Right? There's, a, in fact, a big historical literature on the subject. Uh, a lot of people, you know, are struggling with the notion. Okay, and here's our favorite formulation, J's and mine, the ultra weak, where you two take the two equations, right? <coughs> 
and you relax both of them. So now your solution is as weak as you can think of, just the L2 functions, when your fast guys are coming from this age div and age one spaces with the proper body condition built on. So six, at, at most six formulations, and of course uh, you may uh, now uh, ask yourself the question, so, so what? I mean, you just have made my life more complicated. I had one decent formulation so far that I had to struggle with, now you tell me I have six. Now let me tell you what happens, okay? I still have a couple of minutes, right? So there are two things happen. First of all, I want to emphasize that these formulations have different variational settings. And if they have different variational settings, you will be converging in different norms. In the ultra weak variational setting, you're converging in the weakest norm possible. You don't care about derivatives. <coughs> Does it matter? You bet it does. Talk to the wave propagation people that are interested in high frequency solutions. They don't give dumb about derivatives. All they want to see is the waveform. So I translate it into a request control L2 norm for me, nothing else. But if you talk to a structural engineer, I want the derivatives. I said, why do you want the derivatives if I give you stresses anyway? And then it's a different <laughs> question and more difficult to answer, but you make a choice. Right? And depending upon what, cho what choice you made, what method you pursue, what variation of formulation, you build a different final method. And as you will see, DPG provides a framework that can tackle not just one of them, but all of them in the same unified way, in the same code. More than that, you can couple them. So you can take a domain, you know, break it into subdomains. And you say, okay, here I'm going to use this variation mode, here I'm going to use this one, and so on. So again, the question is, why would you do that? <laughs> so some of them have different stability properties than others in context of more difficult problems. For instance, for elasticity, there's an issue of volumetric locking. And the mixed formulation number two and the ultra formulations are the two formulations that do not lock. You can pass with the Poisson ratio to one half, and you have, in the same code, solution to the Stokes problem or incompressible elasticity. You don't need to code, but it is more expensive, right? So if you open some of the papers that I have written my students, you'll find examples where, you know, you may have a rubber part and you may have a steel part, right? And we use different formulation for different parts because it's cheaper and easier, right? We avoid the volumetric locking. So volumetric locking, I don't look at it as a deficiency of finite elements. I look at it as a deficiency of the stability, the variation of formulation. I mean, the big reason why I've been struggling with that is the wrong variation of formulation. You include the pressures and additional unknown, you don't have any locking from day one. That was communicated to me as a big secret by Oleg Zinkevich by late 80s. All right, and so took some time to understand these things, right? So uh, so that's the big point here, that you see as mathematicians the big picture and a huge battlefield where you can do a lot of new, uh, new work and new stuff. And I'll stop here and pass the, the ball to Jay. I could make your life actually more complicated mm -hmm. because you also made a choice of how you had to put the bar I have to do what? Where you put the epsilon. That, that's right. That's so right. You, you could ask the question, I'm actually that's, interested that's, that's Robert, you, in right. what happens when epsilon is zero. So the singular. Right, right. Okay, okay. I didn't want to enter that. I see. Yes, yeah, well, because, because I'm not going to talk here about singular perturbation problems. That's, that that's too much for them. To look at the alpha so, the, the, yes, the, the issue, right, that I absolutely agree. That, so, the, the issue that Volga is raising up here is is, that, is it a unique way to, to formulate the first order system? The answer is no. So, as you will see, for instance, when I made my big bilinear form, right, from the two small, I can add them, but I can take any linear combinations I want. And this, in fact, will affect the definition of residual, and what Jay will talk about. And you get different methods that emphasizes the two equations differently, right? So this is an additional issue that has, can be sorted out, but already in context of one problem at a time. And now we have 
uh, he's opening a box of worms that I didn't want to enter in this introductory lecture. But okay, so is a good time for coffee break now? Okay, thank you.